Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the 2019 drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Chris Sims, BC Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Welcome back to the show, Chris. Thank you so much. I see BC, the dumpster fire, as they called it. I'm telling you, this must be some giant dumpster. Their their loss projected this year, what, $1.5 billion, even though they've hiked rates outrageously? Yes, exactly. Unfortunately, we're, there's, we're seeing a loss again with this government force monopoly of more than a billion dollars. And that's frankly why David Eby, the attorney general and the minister in charge, called this thing a dumpster fire a couple of years ago. And that's one thing he's right about. It is. Uh, so much so that we actually painted a dumpster, <laughs> ICBC blue, stuck the logo on it, and I set it on fire. And I took a lot of video of it because I know that most of us as drivers in British Columbia are really feeling the heat right now coming off this thing, and it's frustrating. And it's important, I find, to put a visual with that feeling and with that frustration. And so that's what I did this week to really highlight the fact that this government needs to change this, that it's unfair for B.C. drivers and B.C. taxpayers to be on the hook for this thing. Because even folks, uh, if they're able to live right downtown in Vancouver and take the SkyTrain everywhere, which is wonderful, you're still on the hook for ICBC because it's the taxpayer that is on the hook for it that has to underwrite it if it has losses. And so guess what? When they are a financial risk, as Finance Minister Carol James has called it many times, it's a risk to us as B.C. taxpayers. And on top of that, B.C. drivers are getting screwed over. We are paying the highest rates in all of Canada. Along with these rate changes, it's still really bad. So something's got to give. And I don't know what it is about change that this government is worried about. I understand they like the idea of cooperatives, so that's fine. Change ICBC into co-op similar to a credit union, which is right in the philosophy of the NDP. It's completely keeping in their spirit, but then open it up to full competition. There's no harm in that whatsoever. And the benefit to that is that drivers can then shop around. For those who truly do like that model of co-op, they can choose it. They can pick ICBC. But for those of us who want to shop around and maybe bundle our insurance with other, other companies, give us the freedom to do that. We're adults. And so that's why uh, we really are trying to set this thing alight, so to speak, and point this out. And we've also just now been hearing that from global news especially that ICBC is hoping, I don't know how, in years to come, that they will have surpluses, that they won't be a billion dollars, they won't be losing a billion dollars, that they will magically have surpluses. And it looks like the B.C. government is planning on taking dividends from that surplus. You know, we've seen this movie before, and it doesn't work. And this is the other reason why we want it changed into a co-op owned by drivers who choose it, because it will take the politicians' hands out of the ICBC cookie jar. They won't be able to touch it anymore. Every dollar for insurance will go towards insurance. It won't go into government coffers. Well, wasn't this whole thing caused by the B.C. Liberals sucking billions of dollars or hundreds of millions out of ICBC in the first place? That's what a lot of people think, and they did take money out of it, and a lot of people think that their problems are partially caused by that. But we think, number one, that's bad. Number two, going forward, trying to do the same thing over and over again and hoping it'll work out is the definition of insanity. So let's make sure it doesn't happen like that again and fundamentally change the way we buy auto insurance in B.C. And by that, we mean competition. And again, if you want to keep ICBC as this form of a co-op, go for it. 
change it. And then those folks who are using ICBC, paying into ICBC, won't get screwed over by a government taking money out of it ever again. The NDP won't be able to do it. The BC Liberals won't be able to do it. The Greens or whatever future political parties we have won't be able to touch it anymore. And drivers can shop around. It's really a win-win scenario. And we implore the current BC government to take a real look at it. Wasn't the whole idea of ICBC to make insurance affordable for families who were being charged a fortune by private insurance companies back in the 70s to insure their kids, so the government thought they'd step in and make it affordable for kids? Well, it's not anymore. They're paying five, $6,000 a year. Yeah, it's absolutely outrageous what they're paying. And we understand that insurance is based on probability and risk. That's how they function. And the probability and risk of a younger driver getting into a crash is higher than a more experienced driver. But to the extent that this is, is shocking. So if you compare a young driver in B.C. and a young driver in Alberta, the young driver in B.C. is still paying way more than the young driver in Alberta. In Alberta, they can shop around. There's competition. They can group insurance, all those sorts of things. In B.C., it's just one stop, not shopping. And you're right, ICBC, the spirit of it, apparently, back in the day with Premier Dave Barrett, it was invented in order to provide affordable insurance because insurance wasn't affordable for some people back in those days. But that was like more than 40 years ago. Gunsmoke was literally the top-rated TV show at the time. The Ford Pinto was rolling off the assembly line. Like, we have got to change. And now, if that was ICBC's purpose when it set out, it has failed at that purpose. Can ICBC just declare bankruptcy and start again? No, because then BC, then BC taxpayers are going to be on the hook for it. We would have to oh. come in there somehow and mop up the burning wreckage. And again, if they tried starting up again, just imagine now. Think of all the things the government could get up to if they tried to reinvent this Frankenstein. It wouldn't work well. And so that's why we're saying, guys, like, time, times have changed. We need open competition. And again, we're, we're trying to be reasonable and say, if there's a way for you to try to keep ICBC in some form, do it in a way that it isn't a risk to taxpayers. It's not a temptation to politicians and it doesn't force any driver to choose them. If ICBC is supposed to be your insurance company, how come you have to sue them so often to get a decent settlement? That's a great question. That's a great question. You hear so many people who are frustrated with it. And again, what's really hard to hear is so many people so frustrated with it, but what recourse do they have? They, they really don't have any. They can continue to try to sue. They can continue to try to fight, as we've seen with the decision earlier this week with the issue of what kind of experts can be brought in on these court cases. There's nowhere for them to go. They can't. Drivers can't use anything as a wedge against ICBC because if they want to drive a vehicle legally in this province, they got to deal with them. Now, did the courts rule on the use of experts to testify? Yes, and so there's different analysts who are saying different things. Some people are thinking this is going to cost ICBC a heck of a lot of money because ICBC had apparently been banking on the idea that they could limit the type and number of experts to be brought in during court challenges to settlements. And this is according to the judgment that I could read earlier this week. The judgment said no that you can't start limiting people's rights to bring in types and numbers of experts. And apparently ICBC had been banking on that, that they were looking for savings there. This court ruling, as far as we understand, means ICBC can't look there for savings anymore. Well, ICBC brings in so-called experts all the time. So, you know, it's only fair if you have the same rights. Now, what about ICBC limiting so-called soft tissue Damage awards to a maximum of five grand. Has that been challenged in the courts? It's continuously being challenged. I'm not sure if there's been a good, uh, very clear ruling on that yet. And again, some, some insurance companies, ICBC included, will have those sorts of limits it, or some governments will impose those sorts of limits. And, you know, that's really up to insurance experts to decide. But I have heard from some drivers who have dealt with this issue of limits for soft tissue uh, damages and their claims where it runs into problems. 
So, for example, say you have, you know, a back injury, but it's muscular. That's technically soft tissue if it's not affecting, like, your bone structure. Whereas if you break your pinky finger in your car crash, that's a broken bone. That's not a soft tissue injury. However, most folks would be more debilitated by that muscular injury to their back, which is soft tissue, than, say, the broken bone in their finger. And so it's those sorts of details uh, that get really complicated. And when you start adding government rules and regulations to it, it turns into one size doesn't fit all, and you're going to have exceptions. And we think the best way to do that is to allow for exceptions. So if there are extenuating circumstances and you need to bring in, say, your expert and you need that testimony, drivers shouldn't be prevented from doing that. We'll have more with Chris Sims right after this. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with Chris Sims. Chris, people in Alberta and Saskatchewan shout out the Liberals totally. Now they're talking about Western alienation. Is this a problem caused by them or is it a problem caused by the Trudeau Liberals? That's a good and complicated question. <laughs> um, I will preface this by taking off my strictly my CTF hat and I'll put my journalism hat back on. Um, I've been mostly a journalist for the past 20 years, and I've been very fortunate to be able to live and work as a Western Canadian in other parts of Canada, including Ottawa for many, many years. I got to know that city very well, and also rural Nova Scotia. So I know those areas well, and I've been blessed because I could also travel to different spots during work. So I've worked in Gimli, Manitoba. I've worked in Montreal. I've worked in Quebec City. I've worked in Toronto. Canada is an absolutely wonderful country. And it's made up of many different cultures, within cultures. What I think is the problem is that too many folks, they don't mean to, but too many folks in the East truly don't understand the nature of natural resources, the industry itself, and life in average rural Western Canada. So when we see things like the Trans Mountain Pipeline being strangled and dithered to death and eventually bought with taxpayers' money, when all Alberta energy workers are asking for is a port so they can get their product out to market, when we see trade deals going south with China with things like agriculture, which feeds us, literally feeds the world across the prairies, you're going to wind up with the election result that you saw. What's painful is that I think a lot of it is a misunderstanding. I don't think a lot of people intend for these sorts of pains to be inflicted on each other. They don't mean to have regionalism dividing them up. And I implore people who are feeling this angry, and there definitely are there. I'm hearing from people all through the West. Pick up the phone and talk to somebody in the East. Think into your Rolodex, find your friends, find your family, pick up the phone and talk to them. Explain to them what the job market has been like in places like rural BC and across the prairies in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Truly explain it to them. Explain to them, if you work in the energy sector, explain to them what that looks like. Explain to them what resource extraction in the oil sands look like, where it's literally sand soaked in oil and you're separating the oil from the sand, putting the clean sand back and shipping out the oil. Talk to them. 
earnestly explain it to them over and over again because I I think right now we're seeing divisions that I haven't seen since 1997. If you pull up a map of the election in 1997 when Jean Chrétien won a majority and the Reform Party won most of Western Canada and the Progressive Conservatives won, you know, dapplings in Atlantic Canada, kind of a mix as it is now, and guess what was in power in Quebec? The bloc. It looks almost identical. Um, and we need to fix it because now I think people are angrier than ever in the West because to them... They've now for years been dealing with such a terrible economic stranglehold that you have educated people, engineers, whose livelihood of the past 15 years has been to find energy, to find oil. You have people like that lying on their CVs to get jobs at Dairy Queen because they've lost their homes and their trucks and they're about to lose their families. You've even seen something as terrible to point out, and I don't like doing it, You've seen suicide rates increase dramatically in Alberta. It's brutal. And if they're feeling like that and they're hurting like that and then they see an election result like this, they start thinking that nobody's listening. But I hope that's not true. I think a lot of times people are dealing with their own pocketbooks, their own checkbooks, their own families, their own communities, their own provinces, and they're not trying to spite another region by the way they vote. But I think it's now the responsibility of the politicians in Ottawa, all of them, the Liberals, the Conservatives, all of them, need to actually work this out. They need to really, really tamp down Western alienation by going after its root and its cause, and that is economic isolation. And they need to get those things flowing. Now, buying just one pipeline doesn't show the federal Liberals are, are pro oil at all because they've banned tankers off the BC coast. Even though Russian tankers ply our waters to take Russian oil to Point Cherry, Washington to make the gasoline that Vancouver uses. We can't, we're, we not, we're not using Alberta oil. We're using Russian. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And we think, if you think about it, that's a great point. So it's, it's like, it's like the government has said, okay, we'll open up the highway. But there's going to be a gigantic wall at the end of it. It's not going to go anywhere. So then what happens? You wind up with tank after tank after tank of oil sitting there waiting to go to go where? If you ban tanker traffic or try to drastically reduce tanker traffic. This needs to be a holistic and full embrace of responsible energy extraction. Yes, we absolutely need tough environmental laws. Yes, we need extraction laws. Yes, we need good labor laws. All those things. But it has to make sense. You can't say yes and then no, which is exactly what's happening right now at the federal level, which again is adding to this sheer frustration. And really, I'm hearing desperation coming from some of these folks now because they're they're looking around wondering what happens next. We'll have more with Chris Sims right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Chris Sims. Chris, during the election, the Liberals made over 700 promises, I believe, about grand spending plans for every nook and cranny of the nation. Are they going to spend all that money? Will it help taxpayers at all? And uh, will they ever solve the problem of unsuitable drinking water for our Aboriginal friends? Isn't that a fundamental question? And that was actually one of the more powerful things that Jagmeet Singh said. Uh, you know, we were talking about suitable drinking water for some place like Toronto. It wouldn't be considered some strange thing or a pipe dream, no pun intended. It would just be dealt with. It would just be done. 
what we're more concerned about um, as far as these promises go is that you're right. There's so many promises every which way, including a ton of corporate welfare, going towards corporations that do not need our tax dollars. And yet we'll have, for example, like you say, First Nations people who can't drink their water at all. Some of them can't even bathe in it. It's not safe enough. That, those are the sorts of major infrastructure projects that most taxpayers are fine dealing with. Those are usually the sorts of things that government is supposed to be dealing with. But they're not supposed to be giving random tax breaks and random amounts of taxpayers' money to multi-billion dollar corporations like Loblaws, for example, to buy refrigerators. It's that kind of thing that drives taxpayers crazy because they see it as a waste. What's extra concerning this time around is last time when Trudeau campaigned, he promised he would balance the budget in 2019. He said that, and it's one of the reasons why we deployed Fibber, who's our long-nosed uh, puppet mascot. And this time, he just said, well, I'm not even planning on balancing the budget. He's just going to spend taxpayers' money willy-nilly. That's like taking out 10 more credit cards and maxing them all out with having absolutely no plan on paying it back ever. We need to pay for that. And our debt financing and our interest payments on those bills, they're all going to be paid by us too. And if not us, it's going to be our kids. And so it, it's really, it becomes almost a moral question. If it's morally acceptable to saddle your next generations with a massive amount of debt that you didn't need to incur, you know, it's it's not as if we're we're suffering from an invasion right now and we need to, you know, muster up our troops and spend tons of money or if we're in a massive recession and something's got to got to juice the system so to speak. We're not in that. The United States economy is on fire. It's doing very well. Canada's economy is comparatively doing okay. It could be doing a heck of a lot better because of the issues that we mentioned. And yet they're still spending like this. What happens in the future? And so that is why we're hoping that he doesn't, you know, keep all these spending plans going forward, that somehow they find some fiscal sense between them. But now, with the way that the minority government is shaping up, where is that sober second thought going to come in? Where is that voice of reason saying, hey, we need to slay the deficit? Hey, we need to balance the budget. Where is that going to come from? You know, we can only hope that elder statesmen, people like former Prime Minister Paul Martin, who was, of course, finance minister for many years, and took on the deficit. We gave him an award for that. We hope that people like that step up, quietly or publicly, and change the thinking that is going on right now. Chris, anything else uh, we should be thinking about right now? I just want to encourage people, no matter how you voted, if the person that you voted for won and you're happy with it, that's great. If the person you voted for didn't win and you're unhappy, I understand. But that it doesn't stop at the voting booth. Uh, democracy needs tenders by the fire. And so no matter who you voted for, I urge everybody to stay active, to keep up with what their member of parliament is doing and saying, how they're voting, what's happening in the news. And if you don't like something they're doing, make sure you phone them. Phone their office in your local riding first then phone the Ottawa office and write a letter. I'm serious. Write a letter. For every one letter they get, they think a 100 other people, i.e. voters, feel the same way. And it's free. You don't need to put a stamp on a letter to a member of parliament. So make sure you're constantly being heard. They use those phone calls and those emails as basically a rolling opinion poll. And every time they get into their caucus meeting, their group meeting on Wednesdays, they bring this up with the boss. That's when they get behind closed doors and they'll say to Justin Trudeau, they'll say to Jagmeet Singh, they'll say to Andrew Scheer, they'll say to Elizabeth May, hey, this is what my constituents are caring about. That's what really keeps these folks on their toes and that's what brings about positive change. And hey, with a minority government, maybe we'll see some changes that we'd all like to see, especially at the committee level. So I implore everybody that it didn't stop on voting day. Make sure you keep up with what your elected representative is doing and saying. Chris, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you for caring. My guest has been Chris Sims, BC Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Her website, 
taxpayer.com. If you have any questions for Chris or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Find us on Twitter at Talk Digital Net, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.